Good evening, and uh, thank you for participating in the work of the Ad Hoc Committee on Best Practices in Northampton Decision Making. This committee is the creature of a resolution that was passed by the City Council on December 6, 2007, and pursuant to that resolution, the members of this committee were appointed by the City Council on February 7, 2008. I'd like to introduce the members of the committee, uh, David Narkowitz, Alex Giesland, Bob Reckman, and Michael Bardsley, and I'm Jim Palermo. Not present are Lisa DiPiano and Wendy Foxman. Um, during the months that ensued after the creation of this committee, we engaged in a discovery process in which through public forums, personal interviews, and written questionnaires, we collected the information from the public which informed the recommendations contained in the draft report that we submitted to the City Council on December 4th. Pursuant to the provisions of the original resolution, the December 4 submission triggered a 90-day period for public comment regarding the draft report. And this meeting tonight is the first public forum dedicated to that purpose. During that 90-day period, the committee will revise the draft report in order to reflect the observations from members of the public. The final version of this report will be submitted to the City Council by not later than March 5th, 2009. The format for tonight's meeting is very relaxed. We'd like you to participate as if you were members of the committee. With so few here, I don't know if it's necessary to raise your hand or not, but we would ask that you at least be courteous and give everybody an opportunity to speak, which I have no reason to doubt that you will be, but <laughs> just thought I'd mention that. Um, so let's begin, and the first question I have for you is, what questions do you have about the procedures that the committee followed? Not the substantive recommendations, but are there any questions or concerns considering, uh, concerning how we conducted the discovery portion of, of our process? Remember we had the public forum. Uh, actually, we had two public forums. Um, and in addition to that, we sent questionnaires to uh, various city officials conducted personal interviews. So, are there any questions about how that process worked? Great. Then, uh, without there being any questions, let's turn to the report. And uh, David Narkowitz has prepared a summary of the ten recommendations that the committee made to the city council. And maybe we could start going through those one by one. The first recommendation that uh, the committee made was that we develop written protocols for conducting various types of public meetings for the city committees, departments, and other decision-making bodies. Are there any questions or concerns with regard to that recommendation? Yes. Uh, I'm John Sinton from Florida. Uh, so you need to use the, uh, to get recorded on the you can pick it up and just take it back to your chair if you want and yeah. hand it around. That may be easier for you. Um, I'm John Sinton from uh, 124 Willow Street in Florence. Uh, I'd like to know uh, whether the committee was satisfied with the responses that they got and whether they felt that uh, the city administration and uh, council uh, and the boards were open with them. Well, I think I'm, uh, I'm the only member of the uh, Inreach Committee, which was the three-person subcommittee that was tasked with doing, as opposed to the outreach to the public, the inreach to the city government. Um, we prepared a two-page questionnaire that we distributed to all the committees. We, uh, I think we got about 16 or 17 of those back. Uh, we got a lot of good information that we compiled. It's in one of the appendixes of our report where we actually did grids of um, essentially what all the committees are doing in terms of their protocols for minute keeping and for web 
websites and things like that. But we also got a few ideas from them, um, some of the practices that they've developed that maybe other committees don't know about, so we tried to include those. We also had meetings, one-on-one -on -one interviews with uh, city officials ranging from the mayor to the city clerk to members of the city council, the school committee right down on the line. They were all very open and receptive and, and uh, answered all the questions that we had and offered suggestions and comments. Um, so from that perspective, given the amount of time we had to do this, I mean, ideally, uh, we had talked about trying to reach out to all city employees. We did put a call out to all city employees. We sent an email out to all city employees asking for their input. But given the, the volunteer power that we had and the time frame we had to work in, I think we did as good a job as we could do given the, the limitations that we had. So that answers your question. It's not, uh, I thought you did a very good job. It's not, the question was not really about you. It's whether you were satisfied with the openness of the responses that you got. Uh, again, uh, I was satisfied. We, we designed the form with a lot of very specific information that we hoped to gather from committees, and all the committees were very uh, forthcoming giving us that information. Um, in terms of the interviews we conducted with city officials, we had a set of five questions that we developed as a group in advance, sort of like an interview procedure. Again, there, we got answers to all the questions, and, and uh, Got some suggestions, got some other comments, and we tried to compile those in our in our inReach report as well. So I can't. I'm, it's difficult because my two colleagues who were on the committee with me were, are here. But again, our report was a consensus report. So I, I guess I, I hope I'm speaking for them when I say that. Anybody else uh, from the panel? If I may, I, I was not part of the inReach committee, but. I think of all the three different types of information gathering that we did, which was one public forums, two research in other communities, and three inReach. I think, in fact, the inReach was the most successful. Um, and in part because of the quality of the people we have in our city government and the quality of the people we have in the committee. But we really, I think, did get honest answers from people who, about what we what they do now, and what we might do better in the future. I might just add that with respect to the public forums, <clears throat> I, I think both of the public forums were fairly well attended. And certainly the quality of the responses that we received from the public I thought were excellent. Um, I think if the committee, and I shouldn't speak for everybody, but it's my impression that if we have any disappointment, it was at the sort of low attendance at our working meetings. Um, we got a lot of good information again from the two forums and uh, the quality of the comments and the insight was, was wonderful. But I think we wish that more people had come to our meetings on a regular basis. Even though, frankly, a lot of those were just related to procedures. I also want to say that um, as part of the inReach process, a lot of city officials acknowledge some of the same frustrations that we've heard from the public. Um, you know, frustrations about uh, uh, resources and about it, how the website functions and communication between departments and, and trying to standardize things more and have more. So in a lot of ways, it confirmed some of the stuff we heard from the public as well. Um, and again, there's lots of great stuff happening in on individual committees that have developed their own practices. I think one of our goals was to try to tease that all out and get it out to the public so maybe we can standardize some of that stuff so we can get other committees using some of those practices. Could you yes. be more specific on that? Well, I was just looking at this recommendation. Um, uh, the Community Preservation Committee, uh, which is a fairly new committee, and they've really worked hard to, uh, to develop uh, practices that they feel will maximize participation and be you know, transparent. And, and one of the things that they talked about in their questionnaire that they returned to us was actually using a screen like this at their meetings and having agendas up on the screen and having the documents from the meetings up on the screen um, so, that, uh, so that attendees could be, and you see here it says, uh, 
meeting chair should welcome public attendees, orient them to both the agenda and the committee rules and practices. I think at their meetings they put the agenda up on a screen so that someone who walks in and doesn't know what's going on or doesn't, maybe doesn't understand how the committee functions, that's part of their normal protocol is to let the public know this is our agenda, this is what we're planning to do, these are the rules that how we operate. Um, and so that, that kind of thing got incorporated. And I think there are examples all throughout the report where we heard stuff like that and we try to capture it in our recommendations. <coughs> With respect to the first recommendation, I think there's a lot of good things there. I also think that in point three, um, should I read this out? Okay. Sure. Okay. Informing the public, especially key stakeholders, about specific meeting agenda items that could have significant community impact. I think that's a good idea. Um, if, if for specific meetings for the city committees, etc., if we could brainstorm specific stakeholders and try to notify them about specific agenda items, I think that's a really good idea. For example, a solicitation ordinance. If someone could just get out there and and uh, maybe someone on the council or otherwise just give out some some uh, to let people know that the, that those ordinances are coming up. Ordinances are coming up because the information's out there, but sometimes people don't get it generally. So if they, if they were specifically sought out, that would be really good. Um, and, or for something else like the Business Improvement District, to just, mm. there's, a, there's a list of, of, of uh, property owners out there who are, who are the ones who will be paying the fee if, if it goes through. So I think maybe specifically calling them up would be just a great idea. Andy, if I may, one thing we discovered in our outreach efforts. Yes. <laughs> was that a couple of other cities which have really well developed best practices procedures spent a lot of time and energy developing neighborhood organizations that they can then reach out to about these kinds of problems so in Portland and Seattle the ones we looked at in the most detail and they have extremely elaborate protocols where every city department looks at every decision and says is this public major public is this public input or not? And most of them are, of course. If it is, how much and how do you reach out? So we did learn a lot from the examples of the communities of Portland, Oregon, and Seattle, Washington. They spent a lot of money. Bill had building up the kinds of neighborhood associations and organizations and whatever they happen to be that they can reach out to. So you really have to build up, I agree 100%, if we could reach out to the property owners or whoever it is downtown, but you really need a citywide structure to do this, I think. Um, so that any committee, whether it's the Board of Health with the hookah bar, or to any committee or board has got access, asks themselves the same questions, and has access to the same kind of outreach mechanisms, ways of identifying stakeholders, inviting them to participate, so that's a big piece of it, and I certainly hope we are able to do this. And that's what I think that outreach I mean, to the, the other communities process really informed that particular recommendation, among others. Also, if you look down the second to the last one, developing uh, online or the sign-up sheets at the committee meeting at that level, you can begin to get people who are coming to your meetings, you keep track of who they are, you can reach out to them in meetings or when the conversation that they were interested in is up. You can send them an email, what do you call them, email blasts to that whole mailing list. Um, the intent of, by almost in a, in a lot of ways, all the way through these recommendations, is to get more the public better educated and more involved in the things that they care about. And uh, so you, you're right. Um, Identifying the stakeholders is, is, is part of the problem. It's to really kind of, to, to the committee to sort of look down the line to where, where the effects are uh, and, uh, and, and then build the, sort of a permanent list of people who come to your meetings and show an interest, hold on to those people and make them part of your, again, uh, with, in, in conjunction with, with uh, neighborhood groups which are which we don't we don't say much about but we're certainly in the research that we did are important um, part
parts of, of getting more people involved in the city. Uh, good evening, uh, Daryl LaFleur, 244 South Street. Um, thank you all for undergoing this process. A uh, few questions. I'm not sure if they necessarily fit in on the number one. We're going to take them each in order. So. Right. I'm not sure okay. where they okay. fit, where this fits in. Uh, perhaps I should have brought this up when Jim uh, made his opening remarks. Um, the best practices committee utilize consensus decision making. Um, I think you're the only committee in the city that utilizes this method, I believe. Uh, I wondered um, if that, if you thought that was successful, um, if there could be a suggestion for other committees, do, do other committees have the freedom to adopt different decision-making methods? Um, do you think it worked well for the best practices committee, strengths and weaknesses? You know, um, I think the consensus model worked well for this committee. I have grave reservations about a wider application. Uh, I think we still operate in a system of majority rule. And we have a representative form of government. Um, for example, there's one item that came up, and what it was isn't significant, but one member, me, uh, did not agree, and that uh, blocked the motion. You know. Uh, I don't know if that's good citywide. It worked fine for our committee. Uh, but uh, the general rules under which we operate about courtesy and so forth, I think those were very important. But my own personal feeling is that I, I'm not really too sure of consensus decision making has a wider application. Uh, I, yeah. I'm sorry. No, I, um, I thought it. It works well for um, a committee that's basically advisory in nature. I think it would be uh, it would be problematic for a decision making body. Um, there were times, and uh, Jim made a reference to one of them, and there were a couple of others where I thought it was uh, not effective when we needed to address the decision and and move on. So a lot of times, something was either stalled or on a particular issue or. Um, not really fully addressed. So I found it sometimes a little problematic. It was good in that it was um, allowed for a wide range of discussion, and that's why I think it's maybe a good practice for advisory committees. But when it came to decision making, one person could, could um, kind of hold up the, the process. And uh, could you pass the microphone back there? Sure. Yeah, my name's Ken Mitchell, uh, West Street, Northampton. One of the, uh, in getting back to the, uh, the protocols, uh, the third up uh, meeting chair should welcome public attendees. And of course, the last part is making the meetings as interactive as reasonably possible. And, you know, that has been my major concern, you know, even with your working meetings, I was hoping that the public would have an opportunity you know, to, to have input and, and watch a, a debate, you know, on some of the, the details of the issues and actually coming up with, uh, you know, changes in rules or procedures that would be specific and the public, you know, could agree with. And I think the, one of the, the major concerns, of course, bringing the best practices committee into being was a lack of uh, public recognition or public rep and, and public representation, the lack of public input, and that specifically was mostly concerned with uh, issues with the planning board, where a planning board member could, you know, simply uh, refuse to address uh, the meeting or close the meeting to, you know, public input pretty much at, at the whim of the chair. And also in city council, this idea of having a, a three-minute public comment where you could come to meeting after meeting and never have an issue addressed and never be recognized, you know, during the meeting, I think has been a, a major concern, you know, in the city. So. I'd like to know how you're going to make these uh, meetings as interactive uh, as possible, with, which will change, uh, you know, the opportunities for the public to be involved and actually, you know, insist that, uh, you know, people who are on these committees respond to what the public is presenting rather than just ignoring it. You know, that, that's, again, I, I don't mean to 
monopolize the microphone here, but, but that's a really very, very complex issue as to, I, I think, for example, the degree of participation we can afford at an advisory committee or a committee such as this would be different than what would be possible uh, in a city council meeting um, in that, you know, the city council convenes, they have specific agenda items they must deal with. Um, what, what I strongly agree with you on, though, Ken, is that um, it seems that very often the comments made before the committee meeting or the, the council meeting just go off into the vapor. So the, there, there should be some way, I think, of recording those and uh, I don't know if you can address every one of them, but to do more than just have them drift off into the vapors. Um, I, I don't know how to do it, though, frankly. Well, just to respond uh, to that part, I think uh, in the planning board, uh, there was a public comment period where issues were uh, expected to be addressed, and the city council doesn't have that. Uh, the city people came come to a meeting um, specifically for an issue that the city council is addressing, then they should be recognized as the city council is addressing that. That's the only way we're going to have any representation. You know, you can't go to a, a city councilor and say, this is exactly what I want to have you say during the meeting, because sometimes you come there with issues that are only brought up, you know, as the uh, the meeting is undertaken. And I think you have to respect the public and say, well, if you're not going to, you know, make comments that, uh, you know, uh, you know, extend the meeting or comments that are irrelevant. But if you're coming there uh, to address something, you should be recognized. Uh, Michael. A um, couple of pieces, uh, especially to, to the last concern. Um, there is an opportunity for some of the committees of city council to be uh, more interactive than we are at the city council. And I think one example that I'm aware of is the Ordinance Committee, where when we're dealing with the concerns, uh, many of the main concerns that come to the City Council, it is very interactive. And we, all don't, um, we not only allow people their comments, but there's an interaction and response uh, between the members of the committee. And if we have uh, people advising us from another department, um, they also are uh, interact. So, uh, some of that interaction is uh, possible and it can be expanded in the, the committee structure of the council. Um, and one of the uh, later recommendations, I think it may be eight, I'm not too sure, um, also makes a suggestion that the council examines its rules. And that's another way of looking at to, to consider whether or not the, the council wants to build in some more uh, flexibility to, to respond. And I, I will say that the, the current rules, you know, uh, the way they're in, in, in force is an interpretation of those rules. And I think we could examine those to see if there's a way, should the council want to, to um, add in some flexibility to them. Good. But that is something that was heard loud and clear from a number of people participating. Alex? I mean, that right to the heart of a lot of the, certainly a lot of what we've heard. It seems like there's two things going on. It's the, kind of the decision-making process at, the, at its very end when the votes are taken. City Council is the easiest one to look at. Council, no matter what, the, you know, what people say, most of the, the, certainly the councilors when they come to the meetings, the vote, they've, they've been in a lengthy conversation, I hope, about most of those issues, whether constituents, in subcommittees, wherever. The debate at City Council is mostly to say why you're, why you're voting a particular way, not to try and convince uh, other members of the committee to change the vote or to really, um, it's a very limited form. Now, it may not be the best way to, to do the city's agenda, but a lot of stuff needs to happen. It just needs, it's just boilerplate. At some point, you need to sign off on those, on the discussion and end it and move on. A lot of stuff happens in the city. The other side is to find a place, and we've, you know, that's um, why we're having these discussions. Where are the good ideas? Mm -hmm. What sort of forum are you going to really debate policy? Are you really going to, you want people to come, you want to hear them, uh, you want to be able to answer them, 
you want to go home and think about it, come back. Some of the complex issues, the, the, uh, the landfill, that discussion uh, is so uh, broken up and so disjointed that it's, it does nobody a, a good service the way it's being done. Um, how you, uh, so I think that this committee and all of us really need to think about that system and come up with, with new, you know, we know sort of what's broken, but uh, fixing it, uh, you know, we're still, we're still struggling with it. And I hope uh, to hear some really good ideas. You know, I, I hate to have it sound like uh, we're asking you for your opinions and we're disagreeing with you. I, I no. think it should be known, Kat, that um, we, we understand what you're saying. You want a, a, a richer uh, opportunity for the public to be able to engage substantively in the decision-making process. And I, I, to be honest with you, I think that's something we all share. Uh, the how-to is what's the problem. And if you have any ideas on the how-to. Yeah, I do. I think, um, you know, I think Joel Russell made a post on the Paradise City Forum that sort of explained why City Council um, didn't want to have people, you know, uh, interacting during their deliberations, and it was because uh, they were afraid that they were going to be um, sued because one of the councilors would say something that they, they were sympathetic to what someone said. Well, you know, it would be very simple to to have a disclaimer, um, you know, when somebody comes in and they sign up, you know, to uh, uh, to speak, you know, that you, you could have a disclaimer that wouldn't subject anyone to a lawsuit. You know, there are simple ways of, of doing the things uh, that have been used as, as reasons, you know, not to have people uh, have a public comment and be able to deliberate. I was, you know, I've been at three-hour meetings along with Daryl over the overlay were the deliberation with uh, counselors. They were seemingly starting some of them at square one. You know, we were we had a counselor say that, you know, well, let's just pass this thing because the more I hear about it, the more confused, you know, I, I'm getting. <laughs> now, that's not good. You know, that's, you know, if the public is more informed and then they don't have an opportunity to speak, and the public really are the ones who are being affected, you know, by the decisions that are being made. So you have to have them as part of the process of deliberation. This wasn't decided ahead of time. We didn't know uh, what counselors were. They were just beginning a debate. And it was very uh, contentious and controversial because that happened. It also happened in the planning board. And those things are, are wrong. Those are, those are things that really deny democracy. So this is where you're really coming down to make that kind of decision. So I just hope we, we do get a debate where we're hearing uh, specific rules that are going to be changed in the city council to allow the public to uh, be ad addressed, you know, the issues to be addressed, because I think the worst thing that happens in government is that you have the appearance of uh, public input, but uh, politicians can just say things, and we've heard it in Northampton, oh, you know, the public had their chance to, to speak and, and uh, but, you know, nobody, none of the issues were ever addressed. So that's something where, um, you know, people are, are allowed to deny democracy, uh, you know, a, a great peril for, for the city and, and our whole process. And even the idea that people uh, are not going to participate if they feel that this is the way their government works. So it's a really big problem that we are only going to have a chance to address this time. So it's all on, on you. I just wanted to clarify, um, and part of it is sort of how, how this set up. I mean, we're, we're, our job was to come up with recommendations, to make recommendations about how we could improve practices, to give ideas, to show research, to do those kinds of things. The actual implementation, we give the recommendations to the council. Mm -hmm. Now it's the council's job to take those and implement them. So I hear what you're saying, and I agree with you. Um, and obviously, I'm on the council, so I'm understand even more so that then we're going to have to take what we've heard from these recommendations and then try to actually turn them into something. Mm -hmm. So I think I just wanted to, I didn't want to spend too much time tonight saying, okay, how are we going to make these changes? Because really that's not our job. Our job is to set forth some recommendations to the, to the city government and then let them take them, assess them, and, and they're the elected officials who make the changes. So that's all I was just trying to make.
Michael? Um, you know, hopefully it will be uh, the last word on this one. We can move on. Uh, but um, I don't know if I uh, completely uh, agree with uh, David. I, I think that if we wanted to, we could decide to make some more specific recommendations. I mean, this is a list of general ones. I think this is part of a process for um, interaction. And if from hearing this we hear some very specific ones, I think we could indeed make some recommendations about um, how the, uh, the rules could be uh, improved for the city council. Um, my concern is that a lot of this would get lost if we just leave it up to, uh, to the council without um, mm -hmm. uh, maybe following up with some more specific interactions. But uh, clearly, uh, there's a lot coming out of the general recommendations, and some of these specific ones I think are, are very important. And there may be, and again, it needs to be um, the consensus of this group uh, to, uh, to move forward with some spe more specific recommendations in here. But I don't think there's anything that prohibits us from doing that. But I do think that our consensus model itself makes it much more difficult for us to say, you should change rule 12B to this or that. We need to have something we can all agree on. So that the consensus model in some ways makes it hard for us to make much more specific recommendations. Yes. Jesus. Uh, hi. Um, should I introduce myself or do I just start talking? Me? Uh, do I introduce myself or just start talking? Well, you know, just for the audience at home, it might be a good idea, even though we all know okay. who um, you are. Okay. Uh, Jesus Leva. And I guess I'd like to speak specifically about that idea of uh, city council and public comment. Um, is it possible that during the moments of public comment, I know that it's uh, recorded by NCTV, um, and I see um, the city council clerk maybe uh, scribbling some stuff down while uh, public comment is going on. Is it possible that uh, when the public comment portion is maybe recorded, that it would be someone's responsibility, maybe the city council clerk, to transcribe that at a later time, maybe submit it to one of the city councilors at large and actually have that city councilor maybe contact um, the people who spoke during public comment so that there's a level of you know, responsiveness and interaction. The city council clerk, in fact, does provide us with a short synopsis of what each commentor has to say, and that comes as part of our packet for the successive, for our next meeting, along with the minutes of the meeting that, <coughs> that happened at. That's not the same as transcribing the comments and reaching out to the people. But we do get a written version of what David or Diane or Daryl or Pat or Jesse happened to say. Uh, I uh, had a suggestion regarding uh, the public comments uh, when you're taking a reading. Uh, frequently you take readings over two meetings, first reading and a second reading, and a few times it's happened where after the public comment that occurs before the second reading, something is amended and then voted on and passed or rejected. And the public has not had an opportunity to weigh in after it's been amended, after a proposal has been amended. So if something could be thought about as far as providing maybe a second public comment period at the end of a meeting, after a first reading has been taken, which would allow the public to weigh in, or after an amendment has been made to a proposal. Uh, because that's happened a few times, and I think that that's unfortunate. Um, I think that you, the city council does have the uh, capability to recognize members of the audience now, if they choose to. Is that correct? Yeah, and we do that as a matter of course. If, if Depending Diane upon is there what... to talk about the school committee, we'd be happy to recognize her to explain what she's talking about. So the council currently has discretion, um, and I, I think part of maybe what Ken was alluding to is that there doesn't seem to be an opportunity for a member of the public to come forward to have a conversation with the council as a whole, unless there is a, uh, 
formal proposal before the council and a person is involved in that proposal, uh, a member of the public cannot come in and address the council as a whole and have a conversation. And I realize that could get kind of uh, murky if someone comes in and decides to speak for the council all evening about something that's maybe not going to come before the council. But I think that it would be beneficial if, if that could be thought about. If How does someone come in and engage the council as a whole? Because going to a meeting like this, we're talking to three councilors, <coughs> but that's not the same as talking to the entire body. Um, so there's not the opportunity to attempt to persuade other councilors unless they happen to attend a meeting like this. Um, even if they watch a video of this meeting, there isn't a, a give and take. So I think that, for myself, I have felt that is a limitation. Um, and I don't know if there is any you know, body in the country that, that does that. But I think that would be something interesting to look into. Um, regarding the uh, bullet point, slow down or restart the decision-making process of public outreach if it is incomplete or unsuccessful, <clears throat> how would that be determined? if it was incomplete or unsuccessful, and how would that be utilized after a certain proposal is brought forth and the clock starts ticking where there's only 60 days before something needs to be approved or rejected. Um, if, if, like, I think the hotel was one of the issues that uh, came forth that kind of spurred this initiative. Um, how, how does that work then, if there's a clock ticking? In the cities and towns which have got much more developed procedures, Let's suppose that you've got a project that needs the minimum level of public input. It, it needs some, not none, but some. So that says then you reach out to this group of stakeholders. You have a certain scenario for public meetings which solicit their response. So, in, and there are, like I said, and if you need the maximum level of public input, they have whole protocols laid out to solicit input from all these groups which they support support, that's the wrong word, which they encourage to come and participate in the process. And that's one thing we don't have right now. I mean, we have, you can get people all worked up about the hotel or about the educational over the district or this or that, but there is no system in the city as a whole which lets all of our committee and boards have access to the same kind of thinking and which really creates what I would call a culture of public participation. I mean, I think we've got a pretty good culture of public participation here in Northampton now. But compared to what they do in other cities and towns, which are really much more elaborate, uh, there are much better things that could be done. I mean, I think that the Fort Public Works has done a good job at doing the outreach stuff about the landfill. I realize people are frustrated. It's taken a long time. But they really have, you know, had now three major public events to get input from the public about all the different pieces of it. So if that kind of practice, which they're doing in the dark, they don't have a model which says, here's how you do this, they've got to make it up as they go. So um, but if, they, if the kind of things that they have learned in this process At some point. were available to other cities and boards, city committees and boards on whatever topic it is, that would be a big plus. And that's what, that's the a long, hard slog. We're just trying to start getting this city to move down that road. It's going to be, like I said, long and hard and sluggish. I think the um, <clears throat> what I was trying to get to is when there is a 60-day time period between when something is introduced, then once that's started, there isn't any. Those are, I think that's by state law. The 60-day, the planning board periods are by state law, because if you're a developer, you want to know that you're going to get an. I don't know. So I think that's not, most of these things are, are mandated by the state to, that they don't have the flexibility that after, after you close the public hearing. Usually what? it's triggered by once you close the public yeah. hearing. So you can keep the public hearing open don't long close the public long. hearing too early if you don't feel like you've got enough information. So I think that would be one thing. Yeah. But that's a, that's a, a good point. And uh, I think my final uh, comment is, uh, this Best Practices Committee is an ad hoc committee. Um, is it correct for me to presume that the council can create ad hoc committees of its own, on its own? The council can create ad hoc committees. Um, 
And maybe if there was some, <coughs> excuse me, criteria established for how ordinary citizens or private residents uh, can approach the council um, to request, I, I know there have been some people that have uh, right. spoken about uh, right. an ad hoc uh, waste management uh, committee going on with the uh, Board of Public Works, um, a committee that would be focused specifically on waste management. The Board of Public Works has many other um, areas of focus besides waste management. Um, if there was a criteria established where ordinary citizens could somehow request uh, this, you know, something that would have guidelines and a process um, that could be brought before the council. Um, because one thing that I think is unfortunate is when, for instance, when this committee was formed, there were people that were turned away. Um, and there were people that were obviously willing to volunteer their time. Um, and I believe some of them continued to attend these meetings, their working group meetings and whatnot. But uh, I think the creation of ad hoc uh, committees, if done systematically, um, could bring more people into the process in a formal way. So I don't know if anyone else would like to. Um, I think there are some protocols that would be worth considering. Um, when, when you start down a road, sometimes before you get into a formal timeline, there are steps you take that you can't go back on. For instance, um, with the hotel property, at the point where the land was sold, or, and I, I don't know the details well enough to say what, but if at the beginning of the process it could be laid out what the steps are and what the places are that once you've taken the step, you can't go back. Be a lot better if things were clear about just what the timelines were. I agree. Especially the ones that you can't take back. That's right. that you can't take back. <laughs> I, I would like to respond. Daryl's idea had not occurred to me, but I mean, you can do a lot of things with ballot initiatives, and you can put a lot of stuff on the ballot. Why not a protocol that says, you know, if you get 100 names on a list, that the council must at least consider and vote on an ad hoc, creating an ad hoc committee. Again, you know, looking at this committee, we had really no city resources. There's no money, there's no staff, there's, I mean, uh, it's difficult to, to jam stuff down, you know, that the city's not interested in. But nevertheless, it's a, certainly a political statement. If you can get enough people who want to do something and, and trigger a, at least a, a process that results in a vote and a conversation, I think that that's a good idea. I just, I just want to uh, explain to folks what I'm doing up here. Uh, I was asked to um, kind of document uh, new recommendations, things that are not reflected in, in the report necessarily, um, our recommendations. And so it's not meant to capture the entire discussion. Uh, Bob Ruckman's doing a fine job of that with his uh, keyboarding skills over there. So he's. Uh, uh, capturing the discussion, but what I'm hearing is some of the new recommendations, and I just want to quickly uh, uh, go over these as re uh, relevant to the first one, is uh, to review and revise council rules to encourage um, more uh, interaction with the citizens. And that's just a general one, and I think there were some specific examples of how that may happen, but that was one recommendation. Um, have counselors and others respond to s specific comments that are made during the public session. Um, I think this is Jesus's. Um, afterwards, by reviewing the minutes and seeing who made what comments, and then having either a counselor or someone else designated to follow up on those comments. Um, having a public comment session at the uh, after a motion has been amended. And if it's a significantly different motion because of that amendment, then we should consider having another session for public comment. Have meetings as a council of the whole meetings where basically the rules are suspended and it's more open dialogue. And um, you consider having that as a device 
And also, um, and I didn't catch all the details maybe of, of this one, but having the council creating an ad hoc committee um, in response to uh, citizen demand, basically. So those were some of the suggestions that we heard, I heard in response to the first one. And I know there were some mm -hmm. questions and some comments supporting some stuff there, but in terms of new stuff, is that about it? Mm -hmm. Well, listen. Okay. Well, maybe then we should move on to uh, recommendation two, which is the city should assume the ongoing responsibility for explaining the detailed functions and processes of municipal government. Uh, any comments on that? Yes. Yes. I think um, the citizens' guide to make them some guys is a good idea, especially separate guides for development and zoning issues. I think those are good ideas. Um, I'm not sure if I'm seeing the distinction between citizens' guide to the city government and city school. I know it's mentioned in the next one, but what is the distinction if there is one? The city sure. school is an is actual hands-on course that you take, you go to over multiple weeks um, for a really in-depth immersion, whereas the citizens' guide be more someone who doesn't have time to do that, but wants to really get a layman's oh, overview. So it's like you see yeah. city website. And we actually found this in a lot of communities, did it as a newcomer's guide, because a lot of people move to the city that may have come from a place with a different historic form of government, a way for them to quickly figure out, okay, how does city government in Northampton work? Okay, about um, snow emergencies. What's that? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> snow emergencies, all those kinds of things. Yeah. Um, also, we can say one quick thing about city school. I don't, uh, C school I think is a good idea, but one thing I don't like about it is that it's not open to the public. You have to be only enrolled as a student. And I'm not sure, it doesn't really make sense to me why you can't just pop in any particular one. I'm not sure if anybody wants to address that. I know it belongs to the mayor, so I'm not sure if anybody cares to. The C school is really, it isn't underway yet. It's still in the process of being developed. Oh, it's underway. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's underway. underway. I thought they didn't know the previous yeah, Someone attended. Someone told me a concern that they just wanted to pop by to one one night yeah. and they were upset that they had to be enrolled as a student as a, and they could just pop in and didn't seem to make any sense to me. I, but uh, I think point three is a good one, but I don't think creating staff is a, a good idea given the current economic climate. Also, the, the second to last bullet I think is, a, is a, a good idea, but it's mixed because it would be good to have um, a person who's going to be on a, on, a, on a committee to be be oriented and trained, but um, so they can learn about the open meeting law, etc. I think that's a great idea, but I think that might kind of serve as deterrence in a way because you know people you volunteer for these things, and if you had if you had if you had to train to be on a committee, I'm not sure if that's. I think that might serve as a deterrent. I, I guess I think I'm not. We're not talking about every night for a month. We're talking about two hours or four hours some weekend day for a whole bunch of new appointees to for a variety of city committees and boards. And I guess I think that that would be helpful. If I'm Joe Jones and I've just been appointed to the Board of Health, I, I may care a lot about the Board of Health, but do I know anything about the police department or the school department or the DPW? Probably not. So it would be a way to sort of get a handle on and to meet some of the key players. And we're not talking about an in-depth where you get grades, but I think having a, a real or a substantial orientation might just be a morning, you know, four times a year, an orientation for a for a new committee, for new elected officials and appointed officials would be helpful. I think, you know, I mean, maybe not, but I think it's a good idea. Michael, uh, just to give a couple of examples that at a minimum. Um, Having, I, I think it's absolutely crucial that every member of every committee is well versed in the open meeting law. I think that we should be well versed in what uh, constitutes a conflict of interest, and hopefully they should be well versed in some of our recommendations. You know, um, <laughs> like, like how to run a meeting. Um, so, and uh, I think a lot of folks that they find themselves having to kind of reinvent the wheel or use their own instincts or their own background. And a lot of times it's not well suited for the public sector. 
Um, when I was appointed to the Arts Council, I, had, I got the whole meeting law handout from the Secretary of State. Is every one on every board in the whole city given supposed to. Oh, I got it. <laughs> we got it. So I'm still doing it. But, you know, I, you're a lawyer. You can read that and understand it very quickly, I, I assume. For a lot of people, they read that and it says, and it, it happened with this committee and it happened with the council. said, well, what does this really mean and how does it apply to us? And I think that's where it's helpful to have a, a training session that can be give and take. Um, <coughs> For a lot of people I know, they're on boards, especially some of the more complicated ones, and they members have said they have had no training at all and no orientation. And I'd like to add also, I mean, for me at least, when I first got appointed to the Board of Public Works, the staff took me out with another new member, and we drove around for three or four hours and looked at all the different facilities that BPW ran. And that was, I just had no idea. Mm -hmm. So, you know, for whether it's Board of Public Works, or the school board, or whatever it happens to be, I think, in addition to just a general required overview, I would hope that this, the individual boards and committees would then do some additional introduction for their new members in house. Uh, just a comment on the uh, the city school and the. Uh, the next point mentioned citizens advisory committee or ongoing best practices committee. Um, I have not attended a city school session. Um, I don't believe that uh, they're recorded. Um, there, there's one thing to teach how something is being done and another thing to teach how something should be done. Um, so I'm a little concerned about um, this committee here obviously has some ideas on ways city government could be improved, which is why I'm holding it in my hand right now. Um, so when it says continue and expand city school, it would be interesting to learn more about that, that's what the expand means. Um, I, somehow I feel as though, I, I believe that is handled out of the mayor's office currently, city yep. school. Um, somehow I feel as though there should be some collaboration with the mayor's office and the city council and I, I support the creation or the reactivation of a citizens advisory committee or best practices committee, however it would be termed. There should be some kind of a collaboration between the council, the mayor's office, and this committee if it were to become a permanent committee, and the city school if it were to be called that, so that the, uh, the agenda or syllabus as it were could be agreed upon um, so that besides teaching people how things operate now, um, there would also be research into how things should operate or how they could operate better. Yeah, that way, if we get a regular city orientation, we can tell all the new city board committee members what the best practices are. That's one way. Once the city starts to move in that direction, we can let everybody know what our expectations are for good public participation, thoughtful decision-making, conflict of interest, open meeting law, et cetera, et cetera. So that's a real way to try to get new, you know, as the old people get phased out, <laughs> we're just train all the new ones right. <laughs> and, and I think that practices are going to change forever. Absolutely. So there's always going to be, you know, a technology, you know, there's always going to be a new way of doing yes. something. And uh, I think the open meeting law was passed in... What, what year was it? 58 or <laughs> a little newer than that. I think. Newer, <laughs> it, but it, it was passed before the yeah. advent of computers yeah. and text messaging and all of these things. So uh, again, just to repeat, I would think that some collaboration between the, the mayor's office, the council, and this committee, the citizen advisory committee, to kind of oversee a city school would probably be the best, most comprehensive uh, approach to bringing people in. I'm, I'm stuck with the mic. Okay, well, you hang on to it. Uh, we're going to go on the next one. We've got to move on to the next one. Uh, well, can I just recap? I heard two things uh, on that one. And one is that uh, this, um, the city school should have basically open enrollment, is what one recommendation I heard from Jesse. And another recommendation that I heard from Daryl is there's a difference between how things are done and how things uh, should be done or could be done, 
and we can't, uh, we should be careful of them being too separate. And there needs to be collaboration between the council and the mayor's office around the two current uh, proposals as reflected here to make sure there's some interaction. You know, one thing that occurs to me is that when I think of best practices, I don't think of a list of rules. I think it's more a philosophy. You could not possibly codify everything that's done in city government but there should be an overriding philosophy as to making sure we're identifying the stakeholders, getting them involved, and giving them a meaningful role uh, in, in decision making. But at the same time, I think having to re recognize the fact that it's a representational form of government, I think it's unrealistic to think everybody's going to be happy with the decision. But everybody should have a, an opportunity to be heard at least in a meaningful way. I mean, that the opportunity to maybe to persuade somebody uh, more than just standing up and saying something that evaporates. Uh, but that's the way I think about the practices. Good. Uh, Michael, can we move on? Or? No, I got it. Perfect. See ya. I didn't know if you had more to say about nope. that. Oh, nope. okay. Just we'll move on to the second number three. Word. The Mayor, Finance Committee, and Finance Director should assume an I'm ongoing good. responsibility for like explaining the city's annual one. budget in detail. Okay. Thank you. I think this one is really, really good. This is, I think, very, very important. To be able to like, maybe go online and see a line item of how um, things are spent throughout the different departments. I think this is really, really important, the transparency, and especially in tough financial times, like the current ones, to see how the city spent spending its money in a line item right in front of me or any other citizen in the city. I think this, this is really important for transparency. Decide when you And it's interesting because you can go online now and see the budget, but it's hard to find. And, and once you see the budget, you don't know how we're doing on any regular basis. You know the budget is well, point two million dollars, whatever it happens to be. But you don't see any. There's no ongoing information after that available to the public until the next budget. Okay. Yeah. I, I think that um, there is something called a performance budget, which is different than how this city works currently. Um, so perhaps um, that could be looked into, uh, different types of budget vehicles that are out there already. Um, that Excuse could, me, what is performance? Uh, I think it's uh, a way to uh, gauge, and I, I don't can't give you the textbook definition, but a way to gauge where the departments are meeting the benchmarks, um, how they're performing. Um, now I, I know myself when I've looked at the city's budget, and I haven't, I'm not an expert in budgeting by any stretch. Um, but it is hard to know, like say, if the Recreation Commission has a $1.6 million budget, how that's being allocated, is it being allocated efficiently? Um, it's very hard for the layperson uh, to know by looking at the budget. Um, the other issue with budget is that um, there are funds like the uh, landfill or the, the DPW oh, the has fund, the, yeah. the solid waste stabilization funds. Um, and unless one attends a Board of Public Works meeting, um, which are always welcome to do. I know that, I know that they're open. It, it, would be, it would be great if those budgets were also, you know, those operating yeah, figures were also funds. enterprise funds um, for the public to uh, be able to examine them, um, whether they're put online. Um, but I think that the city has, I don't know if it's $20 million beyond the general budget. And, and monies that are coming into these funds and going out of these funds. Um, and how? Certainly might be 10. 10 million. And, and I know when I was at in the DPW uh, headquarters looking at some of the numbers, it was uh, pretty hard to decipher you know, where the money was coming in and where it was going out to. And some of it goes to different departments who provide support services. Um, and, and it seems like that might be a job in and of itself you know, for a staffer. Spent a lot of time doing that, so I'm not suggesting that could just be done with a snap of a finger. But 
Um, that kind of transparency would, would certainly help, I think. The budget, budgets have been put together traditionally for the city's use, for, yeah. for the city and the people who are running the city's use. Uh, Amherst, uh, on the Amherst website, is a lot of good, uh, kind of a different way of looking at the, at the budget, and a different way of presenting it. It's also done earlier in the process. Uh, we got a lot of good ideas from them. It seems to be moving in the direction of making the other way is present the budget as really as information to the city. And it really is a different way of looking at things. And I am, I'm hoping that that can be done. And I don't think they have to reinvent that wheel. That's being done across the country. I was, I was also going to add in our research uh, memo, we have a whole section on budget budgeting styles, and I do think that performance-based, I think they, I think the city that's doing it is called like city stat or something like yes, that. Right. It's a, it's a yep. scorecard or scorecard or benchmark. Right. I think it's Somerville or Cambridge, but that we called them out. We called out, um, what was the other one? Uh, uh, the People's Guide. Yeah, but that's Lawrence. Lawrence. That's Lawrence. Yeah. So, so we, we did call out a few yeah. other, a few other approaches in the research as well that we passed along. But I think I think Springfield recently adopted, uh, I, I think Springfield recently began using city stat, and I, I think it was about $400,000 to purchase the program. There were a couple of staffers that went with that, and I'm not suggesting that you know, we have that capacity here. Um, but I think there are other programs, like Scorecard is one, um, to measure performance. With, generally, with the idea of keeping the uh, resident or the taxpayer, the voter, however you want to classify it, as the customer. Um, so it really is a way of keeping the government on point. Um, so I think that some of these programs could be looked at. Maybe a hybrid could be adopted or adapted for this city. Hi, Dave. Hi. Uh, Dave Reckham, with Public Works. I just wanted to uh, well, agree with Daryl's comment that the, the budgets are really complex, and uh, in particular the Board of Public Works and the, and the enterprise funds, and we as a board struggle with understanding where how the money is flowing. Uh, it must be really tough for the, the public who doesn't see it quite as much as we do to mm -hmm. understand it. So I'm, I'm a little curious if you have any specific uh, comments <laughs> on that last point as to how we might do this. Uh, I'd love to hear your thoughts. <laughs> I think it may be, uh, I'll take a stab. I think it may just be, step one would be just getting the information sort of readily available to people so that they, because I mean, you're seeing it all the time at a BPW meeting, you're getting, you know, you're having to vote on transfers or, or expenditures. At, at, and so you're sort of seeing it throughout the whole year, whereas I think the public might just see it in the budget book at the end of the year, or at the, you know, the beginning of the fiscal year, when, uh, when a new budget is passed. Oh, I keep hitting the sorry. Um, and so, uh, so I don't know. Maybe if there's a way to get some of that up on the, as part of this overall attempt to try to get more of the information out there, just so that people are used to seeing it and, and have an experience going through it and understanding. Okay, there's this little sort of mini business sort of or cost center that. that it's set up essentially is what it is, um, and that's how it operates. Money comes in, and goes out, and I don't know. And when you're on the BPW, you see the budget for six weeks. You you get a you get an initial draft budget that is not complete, and then two weeks later you get a, a draft budget that's got all the numbers. You approve it at your next meeting, and then you don't think about it again. You know you you. You know, you know you're approving contracts for X, Y, Z, but does the Board of Public Works look at the details of where the city is, or DPW is about its budget? No, they just don't. We have professionals in-house who do, and they keep track of it, it's fine, but if you ask the individual board member, where is the solid waste enterprise fund budget now? Huh, I have no idea. And just like the city council, do we keep track of where the budgets are for new departments? No, we don't. You certainly should, uh, as a member of the finance committee. You're looking monthly at a at a budget that says what the, uh, the 
how far you are along in the year, your 10% yeah. well, of the year. I'm not on the finance committee, so I don't know. That may be, the finance committee may do that. We they do get those do. once a month. Uh, Just make those figures available as a start. Yeah, but so the, the, the point, sort of answering your question, the affirmative, David, saying that if there was a way to let the ongoing results of any department or enterprise fund's budget be calculated, it would be helpful for the board members and the public to have access to that information. But the now The information is there. The, digitally, the information is there for, your, for the DPW month by month. They need it. They have to know what, what each section of the how they're doing against what they budget. That's what a budget is. It's a projection. And you keep track of it by uh, where but you the are. The BPW doesn't keep track of it. Our staff does. I'm sure they know. And if we wanted to ask, we could. if we asked, we would find out. But the BPW, in my experience, does not worry about it. From Board one, of Public Works does. Yeah, from it. one budget period, one year to the next. Only at budget season do we have and then, of course, it's always, well, you got to do less this year. Well, <laughs> I, I, I think that we could do better. I think okay. we could do better. Uh, process comment. Um, we've been at this for an hour, and we're in the middle of our third recommendation. So, oh, we should um, get I, I, yeah, I, I just didn't want us yeah. to uh, exhaust the, uh, the energy and the time of our audience here. And, uh, not have a chance to touch on all the recommendations. Yeah. I was planning an hour per recommendation. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, we can lock the door. The sprinklers work. Then let's, if there's nothing else uh, really important, let's move on to uh, number four. So the only recommendation, well, two recommendations, um, public access to all budgets and uh, the various type of funds, and something specific going on here, although I didn't really hear a recommendation around the, the BPW uh, budget, and that it should be more accessible uh, more frequently. That, that's particularly more, more and better. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I just want to make uh, kind of related. Um, the uh, organizations in a city that are Quasi public, Forbes Library, Academy of Music, um, something with their budgets, or you know, go back to the meetings of the committees, how they meet at the academy. I don't think the public has access to the meetings or the minutes at the Forbes Library. Mm -hmm. I think that's been brought up during council meetings. Um, kind of throw that in there. Like they're not full city agencies, but some of them get city money um, to include some examination of those organizations. Then we can move along, I guess, to number four. Uh, the city of Northampton should improve its website, be more user-friendly, ensure greater consistency in the posting of public documents, and increase its overall effectiveness for public communication. Um, Websites, I think, are always an issue. Uh, the technology seems to grow and improve, and I think maybe sometimes we don't say, hey, we can improve this. We say we've got a website. Uh, are there any comments on that? Uh, yes. Uh, I, I didn't notice that there's any recommendation about creating any kind of a interactive feature, uh, citizen blog, or citizens could leave comments, and I know that that can be, uh, that kind of a feature can be subject to being spammed or, or misused or abused. We've got a Paradise City Forum, which is the closest. But there is a Google blog site for us, too. Yeah. But, but uh, something, but I think, I don't know if uh, the governor um, has tried this on the state website. I have not checked that out, but... Um, I think that that might be beneficial. It could be, yeah. but if you get its management and what kind of funding is available um, for the website, um, it's clearly if one examines the website, there are things that are added. Generally, when the city wins an award, someone is taking time to put that on the website, um, but other things are not added. 
and that, that would probably be a very deep conversation. Sorry. And my belief is that for the city, for the city to really uh, to take its website to the next level would be a very expensive thing to do. I think it might well be worth it, but it would be, I'm sure, for the uh, I think the planning department has done pretty well getting things online, permitting and listing permits. So I think that's been a very positive change. That's right. But we still need to sort of get all the departments expanded to it, and it's going to be a big swallow. David, did you acknowledge no, that? I, I agree with Daryl. It's manpower to do the updating. It's someone who tries to keep our website up to date and some other ones. It's, you know, and I think we called it out in one of our recommendations for screening maybe a staff person who that's their yeah. focus is to that. Because um, we don't really have that now. It's done sort of ad hoc and someone part time and working on it. And so I think that you need somebody who's sort of the air traffic controller who's making sure all that information is getting up there on the website. Again, you know, again, it goes back to resources and who, how are we going to pay? Who, what staff are we going to pay for in order to pay for that staff or so? Um, I just wanted to say that under number three, where um, it talks about individual committee for departmental pages, um, should include, among other things, the contact information for the members. But it should also include, if you have a comment you want to make, who should you address it to, even if you're doing it by email. It, it, there's nothing specific here saying if you have input. How do you get that input to the committee? Adam Cohen. With respect to um, the website, perhaps there's a few areas that could be prioritized. I'm thinking in particular of the planning department and documents associated with specific projects. Um, I am tra tracking one project off North Street with great interest and it's requiring a lot of physical visits from me to City Hall to ascertain whether new documents have come in for this project and it would be of infinite benefit if there was just one place I could go online so that if anything came in for this project I could view it electronically. Um, I think that would really help the citizens for that particular application so I hope that that would be made a priority and I don't think that would entail necessarily a a major reorganization of the website or work processes. I would throw out one quick suggestion for the website. Is, uh, you know, we have the five colleges in the area and the community colleges nearby, high schools, uh, maybe to develop a program, an intern program, um, with outreach to the schools, uh, mm -hmm. give some students real world experience that could come in and spend some time working on the website, you know, with oversight, obviously. Uh, one very simple and free thing that could be done um, would be to add a custom Google search bar to the website. It's, you know, easy. You just go to Google and you create a custom engine and you cut and paste the code into the HTML. It, you know, it takes five minutes, no money. It would be very, very helpful if you could search the City of Northampton website Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How about an ad hoc committee ad hoc to, committee. to review the uh, the city website, the very city's <laughs> website, to take it on as a project to get into that idea. I have this weird sense of humor. Bob's been typing away like crazy here, and I'm just tempted to say black nine on the red ten. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> website, um, contact info or a contact person 
being identified for each committee, an intern program with local colleges, a search bar on the website, and an ad hoc committee to review the website. So those were some specific ones, and I think Adam had one that I missed. Um, basically scanning in all the documents that come into planning pertaining to specific projects so that people can uh, access yeah. them online. Thank you. that the process is clear, consistent, and democratic, and that appointments reflect the diversity of the community. Any comments on that? Okay, then why don't we move on to six. <laughs> Let me just say that this really is a problem. That there are, my belief, and I would be happy to be wrong, it's hard to find qualified people who want to serve on the wide range of city boards and committees we have. Uh, it would be unfortunate, and if we did a better job at publicizing what they do in the vacancies, that might help. But I really do do believe that it's hard to find people who want to serve on some of these boards and committees. So, volunteer away. <laughs> um, you know, to make, ask the question, I don't know if this uh, board would be able to answer it. The uh, use of special municipal employees by the city, um, it's not clear to me how frequently uh, people are designated special municipal employees, but I don't know what those are. I, I believe that, uh, anybody else can jump in, but I believe it permits um, someone to conduct business with the city as long as the business with the city doesn't come before the board that the person is sitting on. Um, I think an example is uh, uh, Ken Jodry um, works for an architectural firm that worked on really library and that's working on the police station proposal right. and he probably needs to recuse himself from making any decisions on that. I, I don't know the extent <coughs> to which uh, people are classified as special municipal employees in the city um, and I think uh, uh, part of it has been you know, finding qualified people to serve. but. I think um, having some clear-cut guidelines on the use of those would be helpful. Michael. Yeah, I, I have a little bit of a different perspective than Bob does on um, the citizen participation on committees. And um, I want to go back to uh, when uh, Mary Ford was first elected as mayor and brought with her at least what was perceived as sort of a different outlook on um, citizen involvement. And she created a citizens committee, a committee of citizens involved in handful of citizens, um, who developed, uh, redid the application, um, established the process, and went out into the community and solicited volunteers and built a backlog of applicants to get involved. And a lot of people won't consider doing something unless they're asked to. And I think a lot of people feel like they're not being asked to, that this is a more of a process where you have to take the initiative and uh, to do it. And uh, it, the perception is that it's kind of a closed process right now. So I think there's a lot that we can do to um, kind of crack that, uh, that perception even if it's not reality, that's the perception. And I think by us taking on some of that responsibility, us being the city, um, that we need to take the first action and, and kind of step forward. And then I think we would get a lot more of a response than we can get for some of our needs. And I have no recommendations on this one. So. <laughs> well, that's the last recommendation. Which one? Oh, yeah, that's up there. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, we want the last one to go through. Yeah. Except none of us want to throw. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, number six is uh, commission an independent review of the Office of Planning and Development. Uh, uh, and I invite my colleagues to correct me if, if they disagree with anything I'm saying here, but obviously the Office of Planning and Development is involved in almost every major undertaking of the city, so it's not unusual that it would attract uh, greater scrutiny maybe from some members of the public. Um, what we are talking here, in case it's not clear, is I think we were envisioning some kind of an outside review, as was done with other departments uh, historically, and they benefited from it, from what I'm told. And so it's um, not pointing out the department at all, but an attempt to, uh, to just take a look at this incredibly important department. Um, well, the microphone is on. Sorry, John. This, this is my meat. <laughs> uh, as some of you may know, I was a planner for 30 years or so. Um, and looking at your recommendations, I um, support them strongly. I, I love the rather dainty language that you use to suggest that this is uh, this has been an ongoing problem for some time and that perhaps uh, the decision makers should look to themselves. Uh, let me just suggest to you that, you know, having done this kind of planning stuff for 30 years and gotten beat about the head roundly and soundly, uh, what actually is going on, I don't know whether you discussed this in the committee, what goes on in these processes is uh, uh, not parallel, but often divergent uh, conversations based on very different perceptions. Uh, and the planners come in essentially as outsiders and describe the place as they see it uh, and what should be done for the place because they have been trained, as I was, at the fabulous University of Massachusetts. LARP, etc. Um, so that they know what is best for the future of the place. They meet in a meeting with citizens of the town who are furious that they have essentially invaded the space of the residents of this town, who see the place not as a descriptive kind of scientific series of zones or whatever, but they see it as a narrative, which is essentially a narrative of their lives. Uh, and therefore, they're infuriated that these outsiders are trying to impose some kind of structure or picture upon them, which is foreign. And on their part, the planners are infuriated that these uh, people who know nothing whatever about planning, nor do they even respect the the degree of competence which these planners possess should even be telling them what to do. Uh, and so they become inimical parties to a common purpose. Uh, and that essentially is what has been, I think, happening here. Um, your recommendations, I think, will tone it. The conversation needs to be toned down. Conversation needs to be toned down a lot. It seems to me, and I wrote about this at some point or another, that the professionals should behave as the parents in the sense that they are the ones who are in charge and therefore they have to listen and to know better what they're hearing from whoever is telling them what these narratives are or participate in their narratives themselves. Or the planners themselves should attach themselves to teenagers and children and walk around with them to see what that place is and why these particular places are important, not because of particular numbers or the amount of open space or whatever it is, but become part of the place itself. Um, the only specific recommendation that I have is that 
whenever an RFP, a request for a proposal comes up, that that be open. The minute the RFP comes up, that those not only in the neighborhood but in the town should know what the RFP is. Uh, that was frankly the beginning of the problems, I think, with the hotel. Um, and were the discussions open at, at that point in time, it would have diffused a huge problem that, that, we, that we currently have. But I do want to congratulate the, the committee on, on the job that it did on this. It was very sensitive and, and well done. Consensus. Consensus led us to this I, I never language. thought I'd ever call Bob, <laughs> Bob Reckman a, a, a sensitive teenage, uh, a sensitive New Age guy. Teenage guy. But thanks a lot for that. But, you know, John, yeah. just for my own clarification, so you're, oh, you, you're, you're sort of saying like a dispassionate discussion is appropriate. Absolutely. Yeah. I would kind of make comments that, in my mind, go along with John's. Uh, I don't view planning as policy making, and I think sometimes that happens, um, maybe inadvertently or, or because there's no one else to make a policy. Um, I think there are different processes involved in those disciplines, and sometimes there's a, some gray area, some crossover. Uh, with that said, the, the planning department has at times sponsored things. Um, I believe the education use overlay was something that the planning department uh, sponsored or endorsed. And um, when the planning department has staffers that it's sharing, I believe it has uh, Bruce Young uh, staffs the Conservation Commission um, and he works out of the planning department. I think John Fry staffs the Community Preservation Committee and works in the building department. We are making the use of employees, um, but I think sometimes that can become problematic. Um, when a department, a city department that's not elected, is setting policy and staffing various boards um, that may be making decisions as well, that there can be problems with that, there can be conflicts. Not necessarily, you know, evil conflicts, uh, but certainly there can be some, uh, I think, structural problems with that. Um, with regard to the hotel, uh, I know I took a look at the, uh, the uh, two bids that came in, and uh, personally I didn't think the analysis of the competing bids went far enough, um, and we were here we were asking the planning department to perform an economic, an economic analysis, uh, which may be beyond its purview. Um, so I think that, you know, maybe a review, I think we're very lucky to have Wayne Fyden here in the city. Um, I know him personally, I've walked his dog, um, so you know, I, I know he would understand where I'm coming from, but I do think that there are some things uh, structurally with the planning department that could be amended to be made better. And then one of the dilemmas we have in the city here is that our planning department is so small. I mean, I know that for both the, BP, the DPW and the fire department, having outside independent reviews were very helpful processes because both departments were stuck in bad rub of one sort or another. So, and because we don't have a big planning department, it would really be hard. I agree it's a problem, but how to solve it, I'm not so sure. Um. Yeah. <coughs> yeah, I have a concern with the uh, planning department uh, also. In, in, with the overlay, the mayor sponsored the Smith College overlay and directed the planning department to approve it. I was complaining that there wasn't any study uh, on the impact of the overlay, you know, the social or economic impact. That's something that should have been done. And uh, I just felt the, uh, the planning, Office of Planning and Development was, was abused or used, you know, sort of politically. This was the mayor's agenda. And also when it came to uh, Paul Morgan's move, you know, I would have felt that the uh, planning department should have been involved in feeling like there should have been a review where other sites were, were looked at, or at least a report from the planning department. They just seem to be uh, involved in rubber stamping decisions 
that are made by the mayor, and I think that that really is something that you know really does the city no good if they if they can get away with doing that. I think there's got there has to be some enforcement or, or, or that sort of thing can't happen because I think I think we've seen uh, awful consequences for that. When Biden came into the meeting for the uh, the overlay, saying that the uh, development agreement, saying this was a uh, clear uh, agreement that was easily enforceable in court, but and this was what he was saying to uh, city council. But you know there was there was no lawyer uh, that signed off on the development agreement, and uh, you know he's he's made legal uh, interpretations on a number of things that the the city council, you know, perhaps should have confronted, but I think uh, they sort of are deferring to the planning department, uh, sort of, and also deferring to the mayor. And I think we just need something where uh, the public has to be able to be able to um, rely on the planning department or confront the planning department, uh, you know, over these decisions that seem that they have not participated in. Ken, you know, thank you for those comments. I think the kinds of comments that you made are similar to comments we got in the public forum, even from you, mm -hmm. Peter, which led us to this conclusion. Uh, and so the question I guess I would have to you is, is there anything that you feel that in our recommendations we've omitted, uh, rather than specific, uh, you know, concerns about the department or something like that, because those are the concerns that prompted the recommendations, right. I'm trying to say. I guess what I'm saying is where do you, uh, where is the enforcement, or how, how can the public say that this hasn't been addressed and then have either city council or someone in city government say that now this has to be addressed, rather so than... I, number, I mean, nine I mean, number nine will get you Number nine will get you Okay. Yes, sir. Ed, um, just a little uh, clarification on, on this, and I, I think you touched on it a little bit, Jim, is uh, this was something I think when, when each of the members of this committee came up with our list of uh, recommendations on our own and compiled them, I think this was on the list of uh, several of us. I know it was on my list. And I put it on there in this format out of um, recognition that the work of the planning board is very complex. Um, I certainly don't understand it as well as I understand many of the other uh, committees. So I didn't think any of us, or I felt I wasn't in the position to make a lot of the specific recommendations. And um, that, uh, and I, I think John, uh, John is in agreement in his remarks, I hope so, that um, other professionals looking at it objectively could um, make some, you know, kind of hold up a mirror and say, here are some things that could be could be done differently. Certainly, that has is what happened in the other departments in the city that have gone through this type of review. But it's really out of respect to the planning department and the planning board for the complexity of their their work, and that's why we crafted it the way we crafted it. Okay. What I've heard from this one, for specific ones, is that um, the, sh the, uh, the request for proposal process should be more open and transparent. Um, and there's been some flaws, perceived flaws, in what has happened in the past. There should be uh, clarity in between decision making um, uh, versus policy setting. And sometimes it looks like both are going on in with a particular issue. And that needs to be clarified a little bit or what. Um, and then there's uh, uh, the relationship between planning and the mayor's office um, sometimes seems uh, not very clear or very uh, close. And that it should be a little bit more perhaps objective. And one specific example is consideration of independent legal counsel, for example, on some of their decisions. So those are the three points that I've heard in the, in the discussion. And let's move, Jesse, did you have your hand up? No. Oh, I'm sorry, okay. Um, and move on to seven then, create a vision mission statement 
for city government that prioritizes citizen engagement and participation, ethical behavior, and best practices in decision making. Nobody against on this committee. So. No. <laughs> All right. Maybe, maybe it doesn't require any uh, discussion at this point, so let's move on to eight. I'd like to make one kind of, to go back to six, the, the, uh, the discussion between policy and Professional uh, and the professional process is really complicated. We we talked about this. We looked at this a lot. The uh, it's, you assume, in fact, that that the policy is being made by the mayor and the city council and to a lesser extent by the planning board, and it flows down. And that the planning department is executing what it's told are the policies. And I don't. And uh, I think. I'm not sure that some of the complaint against the planning department is really needs to be addressed at the political process. That in fact that's the policy has been made without clear and it's not clear you're going to get through the planning department that way. Policy is made by the political side of the city or should be, and that's where somehow you have to get a grab it. Could could I just add to that and um this, this whole Notre Dame business that came up, right? The, the whole Notre Dame business brought that, brought that to light. Uh, if there is to be a vision for Northampton, should it not be city government that should be setting policy to help envision the place? And that would take the burden off of the planning department for making decisions that the citizens think that they're just coming out of nowhere. That these are appointees who are acting as though they were elected officials. So, yeah, I think um, that that's, I don't know where you begin the discussion, but it's really critical. Okay. Uh, number seven. So we're up to number eight. Designated Standing Committee to continue the work begun by the Ad Hoc Committee to improve city decision making and promote public participation. I have a question. Yes. Um, the Unutilized Citizens Advisory Committee, the first bullet, how similar is that to this? When we drafted this recommendation, we didn't have the language for the old Citizens Advisory Committee. It was our belief that with some minor changes, it might be recreated to serve as a best practice committee or something another best practice committee could be appointed. And we don't really care. That's our, we knew that there was this citizen advisory committee that was set up with the best of intentions and has fallen into disuse. And if it could be revitalized to focus on best practices, that would be as good as, as we're concerned, I believe, we're concerned as having a specially appointed best practice. When it was in use, what did it do? I don't know. It, no. <laughs> it, it was set up in the, there, prior to CDBG, there were federal programs through HUD that required every community to have one of these citizen advisory committees. So this was a, I forgot what the, I forgot what the program name was, but if you go and read the ordinance today, it's not still on the books. It refers to this particular government program. And so every municipality that received those funds had to have one of these citizen advisory committees. And essentially it was each ward representative got to appoint one person, and I think each at-large person got to appoint one person. I think the mayor got to appoint one person. It was, so basically it was this large committee that I think did what we now do when we have those public hearings on CDBG spending. I think they made an advisory recommendations to city government on the kinds of spending decisions around the federal monies. Now we get CDBG and we have this whole public hearing process, so it's done that way. Um, so I think, and, and I've, I've researched a lot of the information about it, and I'm going to try to put it on our website of the various incarnations. So when that federal program went away, the city council at the time, and this is like 1970s or something, I think 74, took another look at it, tweaked it a little bit, 
and tried to kind of keep it as an active city body. And I think, but again, I think there were appointments made to it, but it didn't really have a clear mission from reading that. If you read, uh, you read the ordinance, it didn't really have it. I mean, not, not like the best practices committee, for example, not that specific. So I think um, it just kind of fell off the radar. People stopped getting appointed to it. I mean, I don't think it, people were appointed to it since like the 60s or 70s. Um, and it just kind of stayed there off the books. Um, so when you have a, something like the Village Hill Citizens Advisory Committee, is that created under this? No, that is it entirely separate? That's actually created by state legislation. <laughs> and that, so the term Citizen Advisory Committee gets used a lot. So, you know, Mass Highway now has Citizen Advisory Committees that it sets up. So it set one up for I-91 and has now a Neighborhood Advisory Committee. There are towns like Worcester in our research it has a citizen advisory committee that does actually the role that Michael mentioned earlier. They have a citizen advisory committee that specifically advises the mayor and the city council on committee appointments. That's their, that's what their CAC does. And there are different CACs in other communities that do different things. So I think the spirit of this was, we already have this shell of a thing on the books, maybe we can recraft it for today's needs and, and put it to use somehow. Or maybe not. Maybe that's not an effective way to do it. Um, and maybe we have to come up with a whole new model. But I think that's why we referenced it, because it's on the books still. Thank you. Yeah, Michael. Yeah, you can get the exact wording of it on, on the uh, ordinances and uh, uh, the city, uh, on the, from the city website. But the one way of, of reading it and, uh, would give it a, a role that's larger, a larger scope than this. The best practices is really focused on improving the information and the relationship uh, between the public and the city, whereas an advisory committee could be uh, given roles in, uh, in a, a wide variety of other, other ways. So um, I think if you wanted a wider scope for involvement, then that's a possibility. If you just want it more or less like a watchdog group looking at best practices only, just focused on that, then it would be something comparable to what this group is doing. But I think we really need more than a watch group. We need a group to move our work forward. It, 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 just if we say this is great, you know, set up a watchdog group, nothing will happen. So we need a group. Well, and that could be for best I don't, advice. That's right. It could be, but my point is we need a group that's got a real mission to improve the city's practices and to, to come up with some specific recommendations to make all the things much more specific, which we simply were not able to do given our limited time and resources. But I, but I also think, uh, you know, it's very important to uh, have that watchdog element uh, in a standing committee also, because I think you're uh, when Jim talked uh, about, well, I'm, I'm not sure we want to really uh, talk about rules so much or focus on rules, uh, we're more concerned with uh, sort of promoting uh, philosophy. And I think we have a, certainly a good philosophy in this city, um, but we've had a lot of problems with uh, the way it's actually been implemented. And I think what we, democracy itself is really just a set of rules. If you don't have the rules don't work, you don't have democracy. And I think that's what we have uh, in the city. Now we have problems that way. So I think we do need a, a committee to advance uh, the work. And a big portion of that, too, is going to be seeing how those specific recommendations work. And um, rather than, you know, the city council saying, well, you know, the idea of having the public, uh, uh, you know, come in and uh, be recognized during deliberation is, is, is not working, uh, let's just forget about it and go back to our old way, that committee could come in and say, okay, well, let's, what was the recommendation? Let's fix it so we can actually find another way of making that possible. Uh, and I think that that has to be the biggest part of, of, of the process and also advancing whatever is going to work so that we actually can have something uh, where citizens feel like they're being represented or and an opportunity for um, if the rules, you know, aren't being followed. Right now we have home rule. Um, the mayor can do essentially anything she wants, and if you want to complain about it, um, you have to come up with money for a lawsuit. 
that's what we were facing with the uh, the overlay where you know we were talked about yeah well you complaining about um, you know this petition this valid petition that the the mayor ignored well if you want to take her to court well we've got a lot of court cases and probably a lot of them that could have been avoided uh, had we had a uh, citizens or advisory committee or best practices committee to actually confront city council or confront the mayor before uh, these decisions you know went down the line where the only uh, recourse was a lawsuit so this benefits the city in in a lot of different uh, ways but there has to be uh, something where citizens can go to a committee and say look uh, the planning department violated its rules you know I could we, we've done that now we have no one to complain to uh, but if you go to a committee that has uh, some clout then you can get it addressed that was definitely the feeling in the committee uh, through the, there was no place for this conversation there was no place in the city doing right. this there's no other and it needed to be done it needed to be done on an ongoing permanent basis mm -hmm. Michael, are you ready to summarize for us? Yeah, the, the two specifics that I heard is the, the need for a, a committee to advance the recommendations and the work of this committee of the best practices, and as, uh, as well as continue the role of the watchdog. And then uh, kind of separate from that, teasing that out a little bit more, it, it needs to be a place where citizens can go to have their grievances addressed. And th that currently isn't um, being uh, met in the city. Right? Did I hear that? Yeah. It's called If You Don't Like It, Don't Vote. Are we ready to move on? David, did you hear that? No? No? Okay. The number nine is uh, review the city council rules and procedures and city ordinances in relationship to best practice goals and guidelines. I just wanted to add to this um, in our, because I know Ken brought it up earlier, but in our research, we identified several different city council models from around the state and the country where they use a different format for how they take public comment. Some of them do it on a hearing basis where they generalize public comment and then issue by issue they allow public comment. Others have, you know, well, one or two places in the meeting interspersed for public comment. So, there, so we tried to point out some other ways so that the council will have other examples to look at mm -hmm. about different ways of doing it. And I also think you know, that if, if best practice is going to start anywhere, it's got to start at the city council level with our own practices and rules. And if we do it, then maybe there's a chance that it'll spread to the rest of the city in a positive way. And if, we, if the city council doesn't do it, we can say all we want about what other people should do. Not going to happen. Right. Here, here. Yep. And that this is also the other thing that David did mention, which I've mentioned to you before, Ken, is the city council could, in theory, have its own legal advice budget. Mm -hmm. So that would be a way where we as city councilors, if we had concerns and could agree on what we needed to have, put, what have answers, could get independent legal advice in addition to whatever the mayor was happy to I think um, following up on that, I'm not a, an attorney, I know Jesse here is, uh, how it's decided whether to contract out for legal counsel or to hire a city solicitor uh, to make that person a city employee. I think we contract out. We right used now. to have a city solicitor years ago. Right. We used to have two people. But how that is decided, um, I don't know if that's the mayor's decision. Um, I'm not sure. I think the budget, this past year was way over budget, the legal budget. It was a hundred thousand, it was over it was over four hundred thousand. And it may be more efficient for the city to have an employee uh, that's paid a salary with benefits than contracts. So I think that needs to be looked at. Not maybe I don't know if you can really do it on a year to year basis, but um, you know, that's certainly something that could be considered. Because the other thing the city's got a couple of lawyers. They've got Lane Riel who works on all the contract stuff and employment stuff. So there's Janet Shepard who does the general city solicitor stuff, Joe Cook who does purchasing, and it's on the payroll. And Lynn Real is also a subcontractor. But Joe Cook doesn't really act as an employer anymore than that's part of that. That's Process so brings that expertise. Somebody who replaces him 
might not necessarily be. And it's not, uh, years ago, it was, in fact, the city was, I think, uh, was phased out seven years ago. That's my memory. We had a legal department up until uh, 2001, you know, 2000. It was, it was uh, during, uh, it was after Mary Ford's time. It was uh, during uh, Mayor Higgins' uh, term in office. What kind of budget does City Council have? It would take, of course, more money to hire a new council here. Zero. Well, I was going to mention, I mean, the, uh, yeah, that was the issue. When we were talking about resources for this committee, the City Council this year has an administrative budget above and beyond just paying its clerk like $200. That's what we have. <laughs> That's what we That's basically it. have um, for like, you know, extra stuff we want to do. Or, so it's, so again, and again, we, every year we cut our budget back as we've asked other departments to cut there. We don't have a lot of room to cut because it's a small budget and we have a part-time staffer who staffs the entire council. She's also a part-time staffer to the license commission. So again, this is going to take a major shift in terms of how people want, we want this sort of stuff. It's, we're going to have to figure out how to pay for it. And that's With the economic trigger. problems the city faces as a, whole, as a whole, not only the city council's budget cut to the bone, I mean, the, the, the mayor's travel budget is gone. So all those, there are many, many, what in flush times the city could think the city could afford to do, the city has chosen to cut back on severely, and that makes it that much harder for any of these things to actually happen. And a clarification on a point that David made is that the, uh, the clerk to the council does not staff all the city um, committees. There are council committees. There are council committees that in fact have no staff. So, so yeah, so, so the, the clerk of the council staffs the ordinance committee only. Corinne from the mayor's office staffs Edlou. I take minutes for public safety. <laughs> <laughs> the DPW staff staffs the joint committee. And I think all the other city council committees are self staffed, including this one. Yeah. <laughs> there he is. Well, and the planning department staffs the conservation commission and the and preservation. And the, and the ZBA, that's yeah. correct. Yeah. The planning committee, you're yeah. right, my apologies. Yeah. But they're not council committees. Right, we were. right, you're right, right. So the only recommendation that I had is, I think is what I heard, is reconsider having a, what I call an in-house city solicitor appointed position as opposed to the current uh, system that's gone on for some time of having a um, Contracted services. Well, and access to legal advice for the council. Yes. Is another recommendation. And I think right? that's that's something we recommend. Oh, uh, I'm sorry. Right. Pay somebody fifty thousand dollars for a study to see which is feasible. <laughs> <laughs> Are you willing to take that on? <laughs> All right. So if we can move on to the final uh, recommendation. Uh, initiate a comprehensive review of the city charter, both to see if general modernization of the document is warranted and to examine several areas of expressed public concern about our current structure of the government. I have some questions, actually. Uh, in our form of government, we're the mayor who chairs the city council. Now, I believe that's the exception, correct? Are, are, isn't usually the council president who chairs city council? Do you have any, any idea? Only if the mayor's not present. No, I, I don't mean here. I mean, I mean yeah, in other well, yeah, of course. Most so legislative bodies, the, either the president or the speaker of the body. So we're the exception. There are a few other communities that do it so just this good. way, but this is, uh, you know, this is, however, for whatever reason, the founders in Northampton, this is how they structured it. You would see so there's just a few other communities in the whole state to your that's, knowledge? That's to my knowledge, yeah. And uh, the school committee, is the mayor is a voting member and chair of the school committee? Is that how it works? She, yes. she, she's a chair. She's definitely the co-chair. Co co-chair. Yeah. But does and she vote? 
I don't think she votes. I think she does. You do? I, I think they have some attendance so. vote for both. Uh, well, how old is the charter? Uh, when was the last <laughs> amend, amended charter? Well, there were there had been some minor changes. changes from time to time by the legislature at the city's request. Well, actually, there have been some very significant changes in the last few years around uh, the treasurer. About uh, in the financial side of the city, and that was part of what sparked this. Is that in fact the charter has been changed, principally at the mayor's suggestion, recommendation, uh, with council approval, and. But, and that's the legislature. Right, the legislature. But in bits and pieces, nobody has uh, looked at the whole document. Nobody has stood back and said, oh, that thing. Well, so this is essentially a 70, 50 year old document. It's a venerable document. <laughs> it's time. <laughs> And I guess I just wanted to address a specific with that, you know, sort of complaint about the uh, mayor sharing city council and was specific to the development agreement and our petition to override, you know, the educational use overlay. We had a petition that went to the city council and uh, when Daryl and I went to the city council meeting and asked city council to recognize us during deliberations because the mayor had the city solicitor there and she also had Wayne Fiden there. The mayor, who was not a member of city council, answered for city council to say that she would not recognize us during the meeting. And this was an instance where the city solicitor said that she had uh, heard from the attorney general, actually Daryl's affidavit is probably the, the most specific on it, but so correct me, but I uh, heard from the Attorney General that the Attorney General approved um, the deadline which caused us to be unable, uh, you know, to get the, the signatures, uh, or to have the signatures uh, that we did get to be fully counted. And it was the mayor's intention, you know, to, uh, to invalidate that petition. You know, she was a pr proponent of uh, course of the development agreement in the overlay but um, since we weren't able to be uh, recognized uh, we could not uh, confront the idea that we'd actually that I that Daryl had called the uh, Attorney General and the Attorney General said that we did not approve that we did not uh, you know say that we'd approved uh, the decision and also Wayne Fiden said again that this was a clear uh, agreement, easily enforceable in court. And, you know, I wanted to come up and say, what lawyer, uh, you know, told you that? Every lawyer that I talked to said that the development agreement was just a piece of propaganda that was absolutely unable to be enforced in court. So we didn't even have the opportunity to address uh, city council to bring those issues up so they would be able to have that into, in consideration. And our only recourse was to perhaps have a $15,000, $20,000 lawsuit, um, you know, to sue the city, which of course the mayor would be using taxpayer money to defend uh, against the suit. We thought, what a horrible way, this isn't democracy, this isn't, you know, city government, uh, you know, this is, it's, it's ludicrous. And so, you know, my concern is that if the mayor had not been chairing uh, city council, I don't think that the city council president would have said, well, we're not going to recognize you. I just have to, I have to intercede because I hear this all the time that the mayor, uh, first of all, five votes of city council can do anything. It, the mayor has no authority to vote in city council meetings. She has no authority to tell anybody who can speak and who can't. I mean, she moderates the counselors in the discussion, but if I want Henry Kissinger to speak at the next meeting and he's in the audience, I can move that we recognize Henry Kissinger. And if I can get someone to second it, and I can get three other colleagues to vote with me, it doesn't matter what the mayor says. So I just want to be clear about that, because we have rules, but we still, the mayor makes no decisions. The mayor makes very few decisions in the city. Yeah. Everything has to be made by the city council. So I just, I, again, I don't want to turn this into a debate about our city government, but I also want us to be clear that we don't put, that there's an equal responsibility 
in these decisions for the mayor and the council. The mayor is a good target because she's right there on camera all the time. But really, none of the decisions that get made can't get made without the consent of a majority of councilors, or in some cases, a super majority. So I just wanted to clear that up. Well, I, I guess I, you know, I had another concern about that is having the mayor chair uh, the city council. It, she's coming in here with an agenda. You're supposed to be a check and balance. City council is supposed to be a check and balance on the mayor, but she chairs um, the city council. And I watch city council meetings, and I see that she can call for a motion when she feels the debate is sort of in her favor, and, and she does. She'll call for a, a motion on a vote, and city council, you know, sort of defers. But she has a, an awful lot of control by, um, you know, enforcing Robert's rules the way she does, and she has the personality to. You know, to do that, and you know, I think she shouldn't be. Well, okay, I shouldn't say that, but well, yeah, all right, I, I think should. That goes beyond what. Yeah. Right. I'm saying obviously, we've, we've heard uh, people object to the fact that the mayor does uh, chair the city council and so forth, and that's why we came up with the recommendations. Mm -hmm. um, and we're suggesting that we look at all the things you're talking about. Right. That we look at all of our procedures and our protocols and so forth. And but I guess I was just addressing changes. addressing but, what uh, David said about yeah, uh, you know, the rules and Robert's rules. We're Simply that. We're going to make recommendations to the uh, uh, to the city council, and I, I get a little uncomfortable if somebody's not here. And we're speaking about them, mm -hmm. and uh, so I mean I, I do that respectfully to you. I know you've been a very loyal attender of our meetings and been a very great contributor, and grateful to you for that. Mm -hmm. but, I think maybe we shouldn't uh, talk about people who aren't here. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so I won't comment on the discussion that okay. has transpired. Um, the uh, issue that we were previously discussing, discussing under item nine um, regarding the budget of the council, um, typically during the budget process, department heads will come in, um, speak to the council, about their departments, what their funding requests are. Um, and I think that not only with the legal um, budget could that be looked at, could look at it with other departments as well. And I say this with the knowledge that, for instance, uh, the Solid Waste Stabilization Fund contributes some money to the mayor's office and the planning department. Um, to, for support services. And using that model, um, the council could adopt some of the budget what, discretion. Kind of like well, not, not, <laughs> not, so much, uh, not so much for itself, but to have the, the money can go from the council to the planning department as easily as it can go from the mayor's office to the planning department, or the stabilization fund that's all ways to the, to the planning department, or another department. Um, so to kind of look at the existing pie as it is and change some of the discretion for that um, is not necessarily that something that you cannot do. And I say that as the council, as a recommendation, um, which would give the council a little more authority um, over how, that, how money is allocated. Because right now I think there is a perception when most of these department heads uh, answer or work at the discretion of the mayor's office, and when they come in and uh, make their testimony on behalf of their departments, the council does not have any independent testimony. The council does not have any budget to hire its own auditor um, or uh, planning expert um, at all. They really have to rely on the testimony of department heads that work at the discretion of the mayor's office. So I think that if you look at how that's funded uh, and where the council could uh, pick up some of that discretion. Uh, I have a question about school committee. Now, I guess it's not the norm to have mayor chair city council compared to, uh, as in other communities. What about school committee? Is that David? Do you know? It seems like you knew the answer. To that. I think that one's a little bit more frequent, actually. I don't know, but I, I, I don't know that. I don't have the answer. Maybe some of the folks on the school committee or the Mass School Committee Association would know. I, I don't. Are there any other comments? 
I would like to say thank you to the whole committee um, for, the, for being on the committee and for Lisa and Wendy also and working towards the whole goal of transparency. And I think there's some great recommendations. And I didn't realize the format would be uh, this would be have this level of interaction. I think it's been very effective. Thank you. We're going to have a meeting on Thursday night at 6 p.m. at the DPW. You're all welcome to come. That's what we're going to talk about. We've heard from you here tonight. And on behalf of the committee, I want to thank you, not just for coming tonight. You, you, you have supported us throughout the whole process, and we're really very grateful. Yes? If, if there is anyone um, out there in the public or if any of us have second thoughts, is there a way to get comments to our Google still? Group. Our Google group, yeah. What is your Google group? Uh, I was, we have a website address up for people who want to download the recommendations. And then this is our Google group where you can uh, you can go to it and, and submit comments to it. Go to the city's website, click on best practice. And you'll get there. Yeah, there's a link to it on the web, on the, on the here on this one. Um, it's cut off, but if you see where it says join the best practices online discussion, there's a link to it from there. It's just cut off on the screen, but you can also go to our Google group. And that's an easy way to email us. And if you send an email to that Google group, it will go to everybody on the committee. And everybody who subscribes to the group as well. So, and all of our individual emails are also on the, on the site. You can see some of them, they're, they're kind of cut off because they don't look at some of the page, but there's also individual members. And one of the things that we'll be discussing at our meeting on Thursday at 6 o'clock right. is whether or not they have additional public forums. We, we haven't decided that this would be the only one, so we, we have yet to have that discussion. So there may be other opportunities for people who could have come tonight. Yeah, and I just wanted to thank uh, Adam Cohen and the North Street Neighborhood Association and Ken Mitchell, they're running the camera, um, re recording all your meetings. They're online, available um, to be viewed, going back to, I think, the beginning. I think that's been a great public service. And so I think, you know, personally thank him for doing that. We do, too. Yeah, thank you. We also want to thank uh, NCTV, because they've covered, I think, the vast number of the meetings, and they're here tonight, and we're very grateful. So thank you, folks. Well, then, if there's nothing further, we're adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.